The last time I was, um, I derived an equation about which uh, later on somebody asked a question and I realized that perhaps I was not very clear in telling you what it was all about. So let me repeat that a little. What is the agenda for today? <clears throat> today we will essentially complete our discussion on uh, phase transitions. Um, we won't be able to touch upon in detail on the question of critical point and critical phase transitions, but um, we will talk of uh, vapor pressure, um, the um, the some of the rules that go into determining what the vapor pressure is and what fractions of uh, uh, phases coexist at the point of vapor pressure and then derived a derived relations among the critical quantities, um, critical pressure, critical volume, critical temperature for a Van der Waals system. And uh, later on end this discussion with uh, osmosis. <coughs> so we have a large agenda before us for today. But I hope that we can cover all these things today because uh, I would like to start with uh, statistical mechanics, some elementary concepts in statistical mechanics from the next lecture so that we at least have three lectures to talk about those things. Okay, That will be only an introduction, um, cannot be um, a detailed discussion. So. Here we are, we have been looking at um, PV phase uh, diagrams in terms of isotherms and um, these isotherms have, they, they show that there is a discontinuous phase transition We are focusing mainly on the discontinuous phase transition and not on other phase transitions. And in this discontinuous phase transition, <coughs> we saw that this P, we will, we have sort of put a, put an asterisk on, a star on top of it to make it look like a very special pressure at which this transition occurs discontinuously in volume, system goes from volume 1 to volume 2. And we identify that below this volume system is one f in one phase and after this volume system in an another phase, so phase 2 here and phase 1 here. is uh, liquid to gas or uh, solid to liquid and that in the middle over here is all a mixture of phases. So in between in here we have a mixture of phases. Phases coexist and I said the last time that this is a very common observation for us that phases coexist. All right, so this is all the jumbled up diagram that I made over there, but I think I've done it so many times that you are you are you are, you are very clear what I'm talking about over here. Maybe in order to distinguish various things, I should start using colored chalks. Uh, 
the great facility of using colored chalks and um, I will also put up a, a line over here and a line over here to show that phases exist phase 1 exists over here and phase 2 exists over here and that this is the isotherm on which there is this discontinuity in volume alright now uh, this discontinuity is different at different temperatures so P star is a function of temperature and that this temperature dependence is given by the clausius clapeyron equation which says that this is delta S over delta V uh, discontinuity in entropy divided by discontinuity in volume and we write this delta S as delta enthalpy over temperature and then delta V and we also now because these two quantities are extensive quantities can write that as delta H over T times delta V in terms of molar quantities you can divide by molar numbers in the numerator as well as in the denominator so we have therefore this, this, this P star that I have written over here is the vapor pressure <coughs> this is the pressure at which this transition occurs at the given, at the given temperature and we said that we could try and for vapor pressure um, this is liquid on this side and vapor on this side and for that we said um, we want to calculate vapor pressure as a function of temperature and we said uh, delta V is nearly equal to V gas um, if it is a transition from liquid to gas and because this is so we can um, replace this we can say that this can be treated as an ideal gas and write it as this <coughs> this is what I did last time and I ended up uh, writing an equation if you see your notes from the last time Del log P is equal to minus delta H um, delta H again for vapors divided by T times R and this plus some constant of integration this has been obtained by integrating this equation in this equation replacing delta V by V by replacing that by this and then taking P onto one side and T onto, other si onto the other side and integrating I got this expression and if I then further um, um, uh, change this I can write P as equal to P naught times exponential delta H by the way is the um, is the latent heat latent heat of vaporization so this is exponential of minus latent heat of vaporization divided by R times temperature T now this is an equation for vapor pressure I had derived this equation last time and somebody said uh, there, were, there were two questions number one which in fact I think we we we, we this, this was uh, this is a this is an equation that relates vapor pressure to the temperature in the sense that if you have several isotherms you know that at each isotherm the phase transition will occur at a different temperature 
So the relationship between pressure and temperature at which this discontinuous phase transition occurs is given by this relationship. Hmm? Somebody was asking a question, no? Okay. All right. So this is, uh, and this tells you that actually, you know, um, exponential of minus r over t. You know that, as I, as I showed last time, or in one of the lectures, exponential uh, of x as a function of x is a function that is that goes like this. Okay, which is uh, uh, one at x equal to zero, and for negative x it goes to uh, zero as x goes to minus infinity. In this particular case, we have uh, uh, exponential of minus uh, L over R T, and uh, as, temp as temperature T goes up, this uh, L over R T um, goes down as temperature goes up, and therefore as temperature rises, this thing becomes smaller and smaller, and uh, the, the pressure therefore increases. So as temperature increases, pressure also increases. Okay, this is this is the uh, this is the outcome of relationship over here. All right. The point at which we um, left the last lecture was about finding where on a given isotherm, P star would be located. Location of P star or vapor pressure on an isotherm. And this is what I was doing last time when the time was up. Um, we said that we will start with uh, the equation d mu equal to uh, V times dp minus s times dt. All right, we remember our equation uh, dg equal to uh, minus s dt plus V dp. And we said that uh, mu is uh, molar g, g divided by mole number. So all the extensive quantities get divided by mole number, become molar quantities, and that then is this equation. Okay? So uh, this is the equation. We start with this equation. And on an isotherm, if we are on an isotherm, dt is equal to zero, and hence d mu is equal to V times dp. Good. And therefore one can integrate it on the two sides. And um, obviously this V will be a function of P. So understood that this will be a function of P. And we integrate it from initial value to a final value. And what are the initial and final values? We actually are then looking at, I'm sorry. We look at the same isotherm, I'm drawing it again. Uh, P, V here and P here and an isotherm. And this is the line which gives you the discontinuous phase transition. And we are trying to find where to place this P star. A little up, a little blow at what, what would be the condition which will determine where to put P star. So we have therefore put this, uh, you know, this is the initial point and this is the final point 
this is the initial point and this is the final point. We integrate it from initial to final point. But when we integrate, we will actually integrate it over from, the, 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 there are these points that we identify also, uh, B here and uh, I put an A over here, okay? So that I, and I know also that the mu here and mu here are identically equal. So this is mu f minus mu i which is equal to zero. Correct? Because mu's are equal uh, at this point and at this point. This is what we showed in that nice pretty diagram over here. They are over here. Okay? So this is equal to zero. So what we have over here is actually integral i to f vp dp is equal to zero. And we would like to then divide integral i to f vp dp into various parts into these four parts. We will have it from i to c v dp plus c to b v dp plus b to a v dp plus uh, a to f v dp. Okay? Integrals can be easily um, split into various parts. Now, with this, what we can do is that I can rearrange. All of this sum is equal to zero. So I can rearrange them. And I know that if I invert the, um, the limits, I will get a minus sign out. So I can write this in the following form. I can write this as a to f v dp minus a to b v dp is equal to um, b to c v dp minus c to i VDP. All right, check. Um, I have kept A to F as it is, but I inverted sign of this quantity, so it become, becomes minus sign, and then I've taken the other two onto the other side and kept I to, uh, you know, change the sign of both of them and. Um, uh, yeah. Is that, is that, uh, I think I, I, this is uh, C to B, right? Uh, C to B. Okay, let me see, let me see. All right. This is fine on one side. Uh, on the left hand side, A to F minus A to B, this is correct. Now when I take this to the other side, I will have uh, C to B with a minus sign and um, I to C to I. No, no, actually, actually, I was right over here, B to C. Okay. You will report the sign where? Will there be? Okay, I am again making a mistake. Huh? So I should uh, rely less on my um, uh, okay, minus C to B and then minus I to C and I am taking why did why don't you say that I minus i to c minus c to b and i change this c b to c 
So this is fine. Oh, there is I to C and C to I. I C. Okay. So this is I to C. Good. Now I don't even know if I wanted that. Want this? But let me see now. Okay. Uh, let us see what hap what is on the left hand side. Here we are. Uh, v here and P here and I have a, an exaggerated uh, picture and uh, here is F and here is A and here is B. So let me look at the left hand side. When I say integral A to F I mean integral under the curve A to F. Under the curve A to F when I'm integrating over P, then it is the projection of this curve onto this side. So that will be um, actually all of this area under this curve, right? A to F. And then I say B A to B. A to B is area under this curve which is equal to this. Good. So when I subtract blue minus yellow, I will be left with only uh, this part, which is which I am writing as now writing as red. Okay. So it is this area. So this part is area uh, B A F. Okay. In the next case, I have area under uh, uh, integral b to c. Uh, where are where is c? C is here, and uh, i is here. So now, when area under uh, b to c is this area. Um, now I will, okay, this area is under B to C of which I subtract the area I to um, this area. So what is left is area ICB. And what this equation says is that this should be equal. Okay. So the condition for drawing the line over here where the phase transition occurs um, which determines the uh, vapor pressure P star is that this line should be adjusted such that the area here is equal to area here. Okay. These two areas are equal. So um, this is I will call this area one and this area two. In my diagram, area one and area two do not look equal, but the condition is P star determined by area one equal to area two. <clears throat> Good. This was um, one important point. The next important point. You know what happens inside in the middle over here? In the middle, over here where I have all those white slashes, uh, lines over there, shades, area shaded in white is the area where phases exist together. Uh, mixture of phases and phases coexist. So that area will be called coexistence region. Coexistence region. And if you um, 
not mind me making this picture again and again and again and again. Uh, there were these series of and we said that there are these uh, uh, lines and so on and therefore there was this parabolic kind of area which is the area of coexistence of phases. So the blue shaded region over here is the area of coexistence of phases. Coexistence region. Now in this coexistence region it depends upon where you are uh, where the different phases will exist in different proportions. So proportions of phases in the coexistence region. At uh, a point over here, the uh, you know at this point the phases would exist in a different proportion than at this point or at this point. They would exist at different in different proportions over here, and we can determine what um, those. Uh, 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 we can determine the proportion of these phases, the constant, the the the, um, um, the concentration of phases at any given point. Suppose this was a um, liquid gas transition. Suppose it was a liquid gas transition so that the volumes are uh, Vg and Vl and then total volume V. These are molar volumes I'm writing. Okay, maybe I should write first I, I should write this uh, total volume V. I will say total volume V is total volume occupied by the phase in, in, in liquid phase plus total volume occupied by the gaseous phase. Okay, this is liquid gas phase transition. Volume is simply an additive quantity, so you can write it in this particular form. We can write this same equation, this V, as uh, N times V. N is the number of uh, moles of uh, total mole, total number of moles. And uh, this will be equal to um, uh, number of moles times the fraction XL of the substance in the liquid phase plus N times the fraction of substances in the vapor phase gaseous phase did I say G okay G gaseous phase uh, times the volume of the molar volume of the gaseous phase. Okay, I have written down this equation in this particular form because here this is the total volume and here I am saying this is the fraction of uh, uh, substance in the liquid phase and this is the fraction of substance in the gaseous phase. So this equation therefore is equal to this. And since fractions are such that x, uh, uh, xl plus xg will be equal to 1, right? These are, this is the definition of fractions. Fractions are, you know. So if this is so, one should be able to replace one of these x's, xl or xg, by the other. And we could write n times v a being equal to n times xl times vl 
plus n times and rather than xg we will write 1 minus xl times vg. Okay? And then collect terms. Uh, of course, now n's we don't want. So we can cross them out. And we can easily now write this as equal to uh, xl minus xl times um, vl minus vg and then plus vg. And therefore, is only one x now, so I can write down xl as equal to um, v minus vg divided by vl minus vg. This is a relationship. If you know the molar volumes in the liquid and gaseous phases, and the total molar volume then you can know what fraction so here wherever you are suppose you are over here at this particular point at this particular point from this equation you can know um, what fraction of the mixture is in liquid state similarly I can actually write down xg as equal to V minus VL over VG minus VL. So, um, here, um, I should, if you like, I can also write this as VL minus V divided by VL minus VG so the denominators of these two expressions are the same and um, here I this is a positive quantity because liquid molar volume is going to be uh, so this is liquid, liquid is it I'm sorry this is that was I should have done it the, the other way sorry hold on hold on hold on I will keep it here and I will write this as um, Vg minus V over Vg minus Vl. Okay. So, molar volume of gas is larger than molar volume in liquid. So, denominator is positive as here and as here. And in the uh, numerator you have this difference which is uh, again uh, positive because molar volume of gas is supposed to be larger than molar volume of uh, total volume and total molar volume of liquid is supposed to be less than that of this fine so fractions are definitely positive quantities as they should be so how is the molar volume of gas bigger than the Oh, because total molar volume contains uh, gas as well as liquid. All right, and the gas one will contain only gas, and gas has a larger volume. So molar volume of gas is supposed to be larger than that of the mixture of the two. Okay, this is molar volume of mixture, and this is of gas. This is molar volume of gas mixture and of liquid. All right, so. Um, now, in, that, in this particular case, what you see is that liquid, the fraction of liquid will depend upon how far is the gas away from the um, total volume, molar volume, and the mixture of gas will be how far away is the liquid from that part. So this is more like the lever rule that you see in your, you saw in your earlier 
statics when you learned in your school days. Um, and it is also called liver rule in thermodynamics, which determines the fractions of liquid and gaseous phases in the region, uh, mixed region, coexistence region. Good. So, skipping this particular thing, the other thing is looks more interesting. Any question over here? Any point? This is all very trivial, very nice, okay? Easily understandable. But this helps in solving a number of problems, so keep this in mind. Next, we would like to relate uh, critical temperature, critical pressure, and critical volume of a Van der Waals gas. And we know that all these critical volume temperatures, etc., are right over here. Right? That is the critical point. And this is the critical volume, and this is the critical uh, pressure, and this is the critical temperature. So critical temperature, critical volume, critical pressure are given over here. Critical P, P, C, uh, V, C, and T, C. Okay? So these are the quantities you want to relate. Um, in the case of a Van der Waals gas. No, I don't want to push it up yet because I want to start by telling a very peculiar property of this particular point. This peculiar property is very important. This point over here is a point of inflection. Students of mathematics know what that is. But we would identify this property, point of inflection, as the property at which um, both first and second derivatives are zero. Okay? So d p by d v at constant temperature is zero. Oops, sorry. Let me take that to be uh, partial derivatives, partial differentials, and d2p by dp dv squared at constant temperature is also equal to zero. Okay? A point of inflection has this property that both of these quantities are zero. Let me tell you why. Um, it might be easy to see this particular thing. This is uh, the point at which uh, the curvature is zero. The, you have either at a maximum point or a minimum point. All right? And um, uh, at this particular point, you are basically at a point where the curvature is, which is the slope of this curve, the slope of cur this curve is nearly over, over here, is flat and therefore that is where the slope of the curve is zero. dp by dv at constant temperature is equal to zero. How about this? Double derivative is, uh, shows the curvature. Uh, as we said, curvature is uh, positive, describes uh, concave relationship, negative, convex, convex curvature, and so on. So this is convex to con uh, concave curvature. And uh, this conca convex to conve concave curvature changes at this particular point. And in this picture also that I have drawn, 
and it has uh, nicely come out in this picture that I have drawn over here. There is a curvature of this creature here and then after that the curvature is of the other kind. Okay? Curvature was uh, over here the curvature was as if this was going to have a minimum. Over here we have a curvature as if it is going to have a maximum. Okay? So, and it goes, it changes at this point from positive curvature to negative curvature. Any quantity that changes from positive to negative passes through zero. Right? So, double curvature must pass through zero. Okay? So, therefore the condition here. So, double curvature passes through zero and you have therefore these two conditions. So, uh, <clears throat> PC, VC, and TC are determined by <clears throat> these two conditions DP by DV at constant temperature being zero and DP by D2P by DV squared at constant temperature being equal to zero. Okay, I just wrote it down over there, these, these, two, th these two relations. <clears throat> we will use these to find uh, a relationship between these quantities. Now, go back. We, we, were, we were going to do this for Van der Waals gas. Okay? And uh, Van der Waals gas, let me write it down. Um, <clears throat> How am I going to write it down? Let me choose uh, what am I what I'm going to do. I think I will keep N uh, where it is. So I'll write this as P equal to N R T divided by um, V minus B N minus A times N squared over V squared. Okay. Here this V is uh, uh, the total V, not molar V. So I have kept the mole numbers out as they were. All right. So now if I write uh, partial differential of P with respect to V at constant T, the <coughs> first part will give me minus n r t over v minus b n squared. Okay? I will differentiate the numerator. Denominator doesn't contain anything. New, de, new, uh, numerator doesn't contain anything. Denominator, I will differentiate. We'll get a minus sign here and a square of this. Similarly here, and I will now differentiate this quantity, so plus a <coughs> 2an squared over v cubed. <clears throat> and I take um, uh, d2p by dv squared at constant temperature. I will differentiate this quantity again with respect to v. And uh, that will be a minus and minus makes it plus twice n r t divided by v minus b n to the power 3 from the first term hmm? and uh, then minus 6 a n squared over v to the power 4 <coughs> So I will put this equal to zero and I will put this equal to zero. Both of them will be put equal to zero. <clears throat> and solve these simultaneous equations. And in solving the simultaneous equations I will do what I was told in class five, class six. <clears throat> eh? I will multiply 
this equation by 2 over v minus bn and yaad nahi aaya acha so we will multiply this equation by 2 over v minus bn and add so what will be left with will be 4 a n <coughs> 4 a n squared over v cube times v minus b n you basically multiply this by 2 over b minus n and uh, add them up so you get minus 6 a n squared over v to the power 4 equal to 0. <clears throat> and uh, then obviously several things cancel out and uh, and you'll be left with a very simple linear equation and this linear equation will give us this is obviously um, when v equal this would be true when v equal to vc and t equal to tc and p equal to pc so here this is this is true when v equal to vc and we finally get um, v critical volume equal to 3 v times n <clears throat> okay Three B times N. Is it okay? Three by two, three. Three by two. Um, yeah, this will be three by two, right? Three by two. Now, in the same equation that we have over here now, <clears throat> no, it is three by is three by two or three? Huh? How is it three? एक कोई गलती में कहीं कर गया मैं हैं? I've made a mistake some oh. What I yes 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 yes. What is the mistake that I made? What is the mistake that I made over here? May pass age b. It is given as three uh, b n. Like in the equation which precedes it immediately. Oh okay, this is three. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. Three b n because this is going to be addition and subtraction of VCs and that will be equal to 3 pn. Okay, good. Now, this is correct. And now I can substitute this relationship, this equation, into any one of these and take the first one and I will get, uh, I will put minus n R critical temperature Tc divided by Vc which happens to be 3 bn minus bn whole squared plus twice a n squared divided by uh, 3 b n cubed <coughs> equal to 0. So I substituted this v c into this equation and I get t c. Simplify this. Obviously, over here it is 2bn whole squared, and um, you have uh, um, all of this um, um, simplification to do. Critical temperature comes out to be 8 over 27 times A over B times R. So, 
both critical volume and critical temperature come out in terms of the parameters of uh, the Van der Waals equation of state and the universal constant R. We can then substitute this expression, both of them, into either any of these equations or into the original P equation and uh, get <coughs> PC equal to N R T C divided by V C minus B N minus A times N squared over V C squared and substitute these values over there and you will get this equal to A over 27 am I making is it okay alright so now here you see uh, the critical volume critical temperature and critical pressure have been obtained all three of them um, uh, are now given in terms of the parameters of the Van der Waals equation of state and in terms of the universal constant R. And you can actually write things in terms of what is called reduced um, quantities, variables, quantities reduced quantities. So uh, P reduced. Now how, how, how am I going to, okay, let me put a twiddle on top. P twiddle is the reduced pressure which is given by pressure divided by critical pressure. Uh, reduced temperature T twiddle will be given by temperature divided by the critical temperature and uh, the reduced volume the uh, reduced volume will be given by volume divided by the critical volume and I can um, easily show that the Van der Waals equation of state which is uh, R T over V minus B minus A over V squared will be converted into P total equal to 8 T reduced divided by 3 volume, molar volume reduced minus 1 minus 3 over V reduced square. <coughs> okay. Um, the question that he asked is what are these quantities and why are we uh, trying to find them? Right? So, as far as these quantities are concerned, you can be very sure. But then, you see, they become very specific to a substance. All right. So then you try to find uh, other quantities in terms of this quantity. So you say pressure is determined in terms of uh, pressure divided by uh, the biocritical pressure. So reduced quantity in the sense that when P is equal to critical pressure, the reduced quantity is equal to 1. It is 1, it is less than 1, it is greater than 1. Okay? Similarly, temperature and volume. And um, uh, this is a way in which much of thermodynamics is also specified later on. And, uh, and when it is, very, it is expressed in that manner, this form, which is so familiar to you, changes into this particular form, which is... Um, uh, in terms of reduced variables. 
I did not do the full derivation for the last equation, but it is very easy and simple. You just substitute these numbers over here and simplify, and you will get this. Okay, so uh, quite a good bit done. I think I should turn to my attention now to the last topic for today. Huh? For today. Uh, <coughs> but it's a very important topic actually. Osmosis. <clears throat> Osmosis is a is a phenomenon which um, happens uh, a lot around us. Uh, in our bodies especially and those people who uh, learn biology know it already that uh, the body cells receive their nutrients through the process of osmosis. Osmosis is uh, essentially passing of material through membranes membranes which are permeable to one kind of substance and not to others so that some substances get passed on, others do not get passed on. And uh, the concentration difference um, creates a condition under which the, um, the, the substances will pass from one side to the other. Concentration differences create a kind of pressure um, for a substance to pass from one side of the membrane to uh, the other side of the membrane. This pressure is called the osmotic pressure. And uh, it is something which is uh, so very vital. And also this is something which is used in um, things like, um, like purifying uh, liquids like purifying water, say sea water. If you have a membrane which has um, which is permeable only to water and not to salt molecules, then uh, the then then the water will uh, get through uh, the the membrane. Salt will not get through, and this water will get through it in a in an spontaneously. This process will happen spontaneously. As in thermodynamics, things happen spontaneously because of the existence of pressure differences. Here, um, <clears throat> things will happen because of this additional pressure which is called osmotic pressure. So we will study that and um, we will see how this comes about and, um, uh, and we will eventually work out a relationship for osmotic pressure in the next 15 minutes. Okay. This is essentially thermodynamics of solutions. And uh, for those of you who um, are unfamiliar with chemistry terms, there is a uh, <clears throat> a thing called solute, a thing called solvent, and a thing called sol solution. Okay? So, we will be using these terms frequently, so we need to, to, to fix these terms also. Solvent is uh, what gets dissolved. Oh, 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 oh. Solute is what gets dissolved. A 
Okay? And in which the solute gets dissolved. And of course, this is the end result of that process. All right. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so let us say solvent for us is a pure A substance. And for this pure A substance, the Gibbs free energy G is the number of uh, moles of type A times some mu naught, which is a function of T and P. Uh, <clears throat> chemical potential mu naught. Now, add one V molecule to this solvent. Just one, one, one molecule. Then the Gibbs free energy will get changed. And that change will be given by the usual DU plus uh, uh, PDV minus uh, TDS. This is uh, the relationship that we <clears throat> know about it. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> DU and PDV are quantities which the changes that take place in internal energy and in the mechanical energy do not depend upon molecules of type A because uh, molecules of type A um, were the original substances any change that has taken place will be because of adding type B. <clears throat> and when you add a B molecule to A molecules, um, um, entropy change. Ds when one B molecule is added, <clears throat> is going to be the number of ways in which that B molecule can go and attach to molecule A. Right? We said. Now, entropy change is, entropy is equal to K log W. And W was uh, the number of ways in which you can arrange things. So if you want to change, look at this DS. This DS change in entropy is going to be the uh, proportional to the number of ways in which B molecule can go and attach to A molecules. And the number of ways in which this one single B molecule can go and attach to A molecule will be number of A molecules available. All right? So this uh, DS is going to be K times log A plus maybe some other term which will be independent of A, terms independent of A. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say A, I should say NA. Number of molecules of type A. So DS will be something like this. And therefore we should be able to write You 
therefore we should be able to write for this ds tds we should be able dg therefore will be equal to well there will be this du plus pdv which will be some function of t and p and then there is this change in entropy which will be minus k times t times log of n a this is the change in uh, Gibbs free energy by adding one molecule. Now, adding two molecules, two B molecules, I'm sorry? Oh, this is, this is all that has gone into DU and PDV, the changes that have gone into DU and PDV which uh, do not depend upon the molecule, number of molecules A, okay? Number of molecules of type A. So that, all of that is some function F. <clears throat> and that will be a function of temperature and pressure. We don't know what it is and we don't, at the moment, care. We'll just dump it in this function F. So now we, we, did, we know what it was for one molecule. Now we try and put in two molecules, two B type of molecules, and see what happens. Now, when we do this, DG is going to be, well, this quantity is going to be doubled because this is uh, DU plus PDV. This is uh, two molecules will uh, turn it into twice as much. And then this also two molecules will make it into log uh, twice K log Na. That change in entropy term will be this much. But it has to be more than that. Two B molecules have been added. And these two B molecules are indistinguishable from each other. Right? So, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, I think we also um, may have uh, said that earlier, but this will give rise to a term which will be uh, log uh, two, in fact, log two. Two molecules will give rise to, because of the indistinguishability of the particles, it will be equal to two. This is what we call entropy of mixing, long ago. This one? Yes, this Why did we multiply it by two? This expression is independent of B molecules, right? So we depend on A, so I have to multiply by two. No, no, no. But this term has come about because of adding this term came about because of adding one B molecule. And if we add two B molecules, the term will be twice. And there is this minus sign over here. But then we also have an additional entropy because uh, the two molecules, if, if one of the two molecules is yellow and the other molecule is white, and they go this way and this way, then this arrangement will be just indistinguishable from this arrangement. So there will be this factor of two that will have to be somehow taken care of and this gives rise to a log two factor over here. The last term? No, there would not be any two because two particles have gone in and these two particles um, together have given rise to an additional entropy which is equal to this. Okay? Which is equal to this. Okay. And suppose we do with three molecules, uh, we will have some terms over here. Um, if we were to do it with three molecules, three B molecules, I'm doing this additional steps so that you uh, know where this will be 3 times F 
Tp minus 3 times Kt log n a plus Kt times log not now not 3 but 3 factorial because there are 3 factorial number of ways in which 3 molecules can go and attach in ways which will be indistinguishable to each other so this will be 3 factorial extend this argument to <coughs> nb number of molecules so dg will be equal to nb times f tp minus nb times kt log na uh, plus kt log nb factorial this is the change in uh, free energy that has taken place by adding nb molecules into this so the total um, uh, g is equal to the G that was existed for A molecules which is Na times mu naught plus the change that has taken place okay and therefore this is equal to uh, Na times mu naught a function of T and P and then plus dg which is all of this G is this and then from there we say that look chemical potential of kind A is dG by d mu d n A and chemical potential of the kind B is partial differential of G with respect to n B various things constant and when you differentiate when you differentiate respect to Na you will get mu naught Tp and you will differentiate this quantity which will be minus Kt times Nb over Na from here and nothing else and when you differentiate it with respect to partial differentiate with respect to NB you will get F TP and minus KT log NA and then plus oh there is uh, yeah okay minus kt log na plus kt log uh, b factorial the question can you give me 15 more minutes I said such a loud yes good such a loud yes eh? 15 more minutes okay then I promise that I will introduce you to statistical mechanics in the next lecture. What an incentive. Okay. Okay, let me make that not 15 but 12 minutes, okay? <laughs> okay. okay. With large numbers, you have this property that this is B log B minus B, approximately true.
This is called Sterling's approximation, mathematics. That for large B, you can have this equal to this. And therefore, um, you would um, check that this is equal to mu B will come out to be equal to, now I will, for the sake of three minutes that I have cut down, I will just write down the final expression that you can verify yourself. Oh, NB over NA. Did I write B over here? I'm sorry, this is NB. NB. NB is very large, so it is, uh, what I meant over here was NB is very large, so it is NB times log NB minus NB. Very interesting. Chemical potential of A type was initially mu naught and it gets reduced by this much. So when you add a solvent then chemical potential of the solute gets reduced by this much amount. And uh, chemical potential of the um, solute atoms increases um, by this much. It was initially without uh, this, this is this is this increases and that both of them decrease and increase is uh, can I can I quickly go back and check with my relationship over here yep true very true um, that that they depend upon the ratio NB over NA in both the cases Uh, solvent, this was, this was, A was the host substance, which was, therefore became solvent. Initially, its potential was this, which we wrote somewhere uh, at the bottom of this, at, over there. And that reduces by this amount, okay? Okay. And um, this is what creates this difference in chemical potentials. Um, you, you notice that P, oh sorry, uh, chemical potential of solvent is less than chemical potential of the pure substance. Okay? If suppose solvent was, was salt. A solvent was water and solute was salt and you create so initially you had water and then you by um, adding uh, salt to it it became solvent the chemical potential of that is less than the chemical potential of pure water so the solution is so the solvent okay it, it should be the solution the solution of the chemical potential is uh, less than this and therefore this uh, this this uh, uh, um, because of this chemical difference in chemical potential particles um, flow towards um, towards uh, lower chemical potential Things will go towards lower Gibbs free energy. Chemical potential is molar Gibbs free energy. So particles will flow towards lower chemical potential. And if you have a membrane that allows flow of one kind of particles, the particles will flow from... So if suppose you have a solution on one side and a pure substance on the other side, 
then the pure substance will actually flow further into this uh, solution. So uh, this is this is what is called. This happens uh, spontaneously. And this is what is called osmosis. And this was, uh, I will, what I will do is, in the next lecture, I will take initial five minutes to um, work out what is called osmotic pressure the expression for osmotic pressure. I won't hold you too long over here now today. Um, just that I was able to conclude from this discussion that there is this difference in chemical potential created that gives rise to flow and that is what is called osmosis. So we will discuss this further in the next lecture and um, together with other topics.